Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, out of Exodus chapter 10. <coughs> Exodus chapter 10, the plague of the locusts. And we're on the final lesson that we learned from the locusts, which is this. Locusts are usually seen in the Bible as a sign of the judgment of God, the judgment of God. We looked at Deuteronomy 27 and 28, which we find right after the entrance into the promised land, the curses and the blessings on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And one of those curses would be the locusts. And the people had just gotten out of the land of Egypt. They would very well remember the plague of locusts and all of it that happened during that time. Then we looked at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. And we talked about the law of harvest. So you think of locusts eating the crops when you read Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. And that led us to a study last week on the law of harvest. And as we pointed out, and I hope clearly, harvest relates to works, salvation relates to faith. We looked at many different passages of Scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that deal with the harvest and with works. We saw that there are many places where harvest and works are connected, specifically gaining or losing heavenly rewards. One of those is in the book of Revelation. I think that's important because we're going to start, uh, stop today in the book of Revelation. So we'll start with a few verses in Revelation, and then we'll see how the locusts appear in the book of Revelation. But first, we see some things related to harvests and works in Revelation chapter 20. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That was verse 12. And then verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's the great white throne judgment. If you're a believer, you will not stand at the great white throne judgment. But all the unbelievers will stand at the great white throne judgment. That's at the end of the millennium. The judgment seat of Christ is at the beginning, before all of that takes place. It's at the Bema seat of Christ in heaven during the seven-year tribulation period that's on the earth. That's where, if you're a believer, you will be to receive your rewards. And that, of course, is what we see in verse 12 of chapter 22. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. And Paul emphasizes that fact over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. There's your harvest, your crop picture, a crop that can get eaten by locusts. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That is, according to his own work. The foundation is Jesus, but we build on that foundation. And verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We're talking about believers in that context. God is going to test your works with fire. Not you, but your works. Verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, that is, upon the foundation of Christ, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. It's rather important. Harvest and works, harvest and works. Harvest and works. Do you want the locust to eat up your rewards. How many Christians have lost rewards? They've done it right, done it right, done it right, and then at some point they blew it. And suddenly things that had been eternally valuable, they focused on the temporal things, and suddenly the locust came and ate up the harvest of their rewards. There's a lot of warning about that in the New Testament. We'll not go over all of those different passages, just remind you of a few. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Don't lose your focus. We're Americans. We focus on the temporal. We're rich in this world. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Now, here's what those of us who are Americans are charged with. 
charge them that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That verse that we all love about inspiration, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But the application of that, not just the theology, the application that the man of God may be perfect. That's teleos. That's mature. When you are spiritually matured, you know what it redu reduces down to in your life? What are the results of spiritual maturity? that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Young Christians, you can be a pattern of good works too. You don't have to be aged. You can be mature while you're still young. Paul writes that to young Timothy. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You see, they watch your life. People who don't believe watch your life. They're looking at you all the time. They're looking for some place to criticize. They are looking for some place to condemn you. They're looking for something that will get them out of the glare of the gospel. Because if they can discredit you, they discredit the gospel which you bear. That they can have nothing to say against you. Looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It's on my tombstone. Titus 3.8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Titus 3.14, let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses. How important it is. Last week we also did a study on works in relation to justification and imputation. I'll not repeat that entire thing, but you remember, justification means to declare righteous. Imputation is the transfer, and in this context, of righteousness and guilt, or sin, the transfer to our account of the divine righteousness of Christ. The sin of Adam is imputed to Christ. Our sin is imputed to Christ. That is, it's transferred to his account. His divine righteousness by faith is transferred to our account. That's what makes us righteous. Justification is the declaration of righteousness. In the sight of God, we are declared righteous by faith alone. But in the sight of man, and that's the point that James is making in James chapter 2, in the sight of men, we are declared righteous by what they can see because they can't see our hearts. The only thing they can see is the result of our hearts in the way in which we live. And that's what declares us righteous in the sight of men. James made that point. He, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. And then James concludes in chapter 3, who's a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Peter said the same thing. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation, that is your manner of life, the thing they see, honest among the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the pagans, are all around you. They're watching your life. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold. You are watched. Most of us think that, eh, nobody knows me here. I can get away with something. <laughs> I learned as a small child, you cannot get away with anything. There were times when I was doing something and I thought, this is probably not the best thing, but there's nobody here who knows me. And somebody would come up to me and say, you're Dwayne Spencer's son, aren't you? <laughs> Everybody knew my dad. And they knew my dad's family. Even if I had never seen them before, they knew who I was. And that happened to me so many times that I began to realize the truth of this verse. 
I am a watched boy. <laughs> and you know, you are a watched man, woman, boy, or girl. There will always be somebody who sees what you're doing, even if it's only the other person that you're doing something bad with. And you know, if they've heard the testimony from your lips, you've just belied the gospel. Dear people, when will we learn this? Yes, you are declared righteous or not declared righteous in the eyes of men by what you do. So the point that we made was that works and harvest are connected. Pharaoh had to learn that lesson the hard way when God sent the plague of locusts that utterly destroyed his harvest. Now, what if you get in that situation? When that happens because of sin, what do you do? This is where we pick up from last week. When destruction comes because of sin, the only solution is repentance. Locusts, the symbol of the destruction of our harvest, are one of the ways that God uses to lead us to repentance. Let me say it again. Locusts, the symbol of the destruction of our harvest, are one of the ways that God uses to lead us to repentance. There are three types of judgments. That's when the harvest is getting destroyed. Three types. They're easy to remember because they all begin with the letter T. Three and T begin with the letter T. There are three types of judgments. There are temporary judgments, things that take place in time that we experience now. And for us as believers, it's called chastening. If you're a believer, you will be chastened at some point in your life because you're not sinlessly perfect. If you never get chastened, it's a proof, according to the book of Hebrews, it's a proof that you are not saved. If you can get away with sin and never be spanked by God, it's proof that you are not saved. Only you know in your heart whether or not you've been chastened. But if you can get away with sin and not get spanked, it's proof that you are not saved. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. That's a very clear statement of scripture. So the first type of judgments are temporary judgments. The second type of judgments are tribulational judgments. That is, the judgments that occur during the Great Tribulation. Tribulational judgments. And we're going to look at some of those today that relate to locusts. The third type of judgments are the terminal judgments. The terminal judgments. That's the judgments that are set in stone beyond which you cannot go in eternity. That includes the lake of fire and the level of punishment which you will receive if you have not trusted Christ. So the three judgments, temporary, tribulational, and terminal. And those three things are all illustrated as principal lessons out of the plague of the locusts. They're reiterated over and over and over in the Bible. For example, let me give you an illustration out of Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. I mentioned it in passing but did not read it to you last week. 1 Kings 8.33, Solomon is here praying, it's at the dedication of the temple, Solomon realizes that the children of Israel have sinned in the past, were judged, repented, and then were restored. That's the cycle of the book of Judges. If you ever want to be able to figure out the book of Judges, you have a, a cycle in the book of Judges that over and over and over and over, God blesses Israel, Israel prospers, Israel falls into sin, God judges, Israel repents. God blesses Israel. <laughs> Israel uh, then goes into sin again. God judges Israel. Israel repents. Then we go through the whole cycle over and over, all the way through the book of Judges. Well, here Solomon understands that, and Solomon knows that Israel, the people that he rules, are going to sin again. And he understands the principle of repentance, which we talked about, as the key to avoiding the destruction of your harvest. 
When my people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, so there's the repentance, and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel. That's after they've repented. And bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. And we've seen the three diasporas so far. We've seen the three returns. We see this final judgment coming. Then hear thou from heaven, forgive the sins of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon the land which thou hast given to thy people. Now listen to verse 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if there any be besieged them in the land of their cities, wheresoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be. You see, locusts are one of the many judgments that are listed here in this category. And Solomon knew that God used locusts to judge Israel. What prayer and supplications whoever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, that's national repentance, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart. Hmm. So we're dealing with something here that's not merely a national issue and national repentance needed, but God has just listed the plagues, one of which is locusts. It says every man has a plague in his own heart. This is a call for individual repentance as well as for national repentance. You and I know when God sends the plague of locusts to devour the rewards, the crops, that otherwise would be ours. The plague in their own heart. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. That's the New Testament law of harvest. It's merely restated by the Apostle Paul. There are many more verses stating that the sending of the locust is God's judgment. Psalm 78, 46. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locusts. Do you want God to give your labor unto the locusts? Think of what you're working for. Think of how hard you struggle for it. Think of how many hours you put into it. Think of how much energy and thought and time and resources you have used to develop whatever it is that, that you're trying to get to as your ultimate goal. Then think of a plague of locusts descending on it and eating it all up. That's why our focus should be on eternal things, not temporal things. If you focus on temporal things, the locust will eat them. But if you focus on the eternal things, God may bless you with the temporal things, but that's not where your heart will be. And the reason he blesses you is not so that you can consume it upon your own lusts, but so that you can use it for his glory. If you can't use it for his glory, he'll take it away. How painful that is to us. We don't want to hear that. Because we want it. We want it. And we pout and we fuss and we whine and we complain if we don't get it. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. Joel 1.4 That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. Second Chronicles 6.28 If there be a dearth in the land, if there be a pestilence, if there be a blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars... Second Chronicles 7.13, if I shut up the heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locust to devour the land. Or if I send a pestilence among my people. Psalm 105.34, he spake and locusts came. And caterpillars and that without number. You know God can send the locust any time he wants. He can send the locust to a church. And he has all that's left. This church he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. 
Your business, he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. Your job, he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. Your health, he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. Your personal aspirations and desires, he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. Your goals for the future, he can send locusts and eat up all that's left. That's why it's so important to make sure that the things you're looking for are eternal, incorruptible, undefiled, in heaven, reserved for you. The locust can't get there. Israel's enemies are portrayed as locusts, the Assyrians, the Ninevites. We see, uh, by the way, the word cankerworm is the word for young locusts. Nahum chapter 3, verses 15 and 17. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat up all like the cankerworm. Make thyself many as the cankerworm, make thyself many as the locusts. The crowner is the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Now I want to look at some prophecy. Because this is really the end focus of the the study on locusts. You remember we talked about how all of the ten plagues of Egypt are repeated over in the book of Revelation, but to a much greater extent. Now stop and think for just a moment. We're going to see look, locusts in the book of Revelation in a moment. We'll see them first in the Old Testament prophesied, which are paralleled with what we see in the New Testament. But you remember when God spoke to Pharaoh through Moses, God said, this plague of locusts, nobody's ever seen one like it before, and no one will see anything like it in the future. So there must be something different about the plague of locusts that we see in the book of Revelation. And you'll see what that is in just a moment. And you'll see why it's so much more deadly, why it's so much more dangerous, why it is so much more pervasive, even than the plague of locusts that hit Egypt when Pharaoh hardened his heart. I want to first look at locusts in relation to future promises to Israel. When Israel repents as a nation, remember Solomon's prayer? He talked about individual repentance, but he talked about national repentance. The prophets talked about how God looks into our hearts and he sees whether or not there's a, a plague in our hearts. There's some kind of a rot there. This passage here is uh, out of Joel. First of all, I want to read you a passage out of the book of Ephesians because that will explain what Joel is talking about. Always compare the New Testament with the Old Testament so you know what's going on. The passage out of Joel, which is Joel chapter 2, a very important passage dealing with the day of the Lord, a passage that also deals with the day of Pentecost. We'll see why those two are related in just a moment. That's the great prophecy that, that Peter quotes this is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. And then he goes through this entire passage out of the book of Joel. But he picks out two things that relate to the coming of the Holy Spirit. When we look at that passage in Acts chapter 2, quoting Joel chapter 2. So the passage is immediately before the promise of verses 28 and 29 concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it is right after the description of what's called the day of the Lord. That's a very important term in Scripture. Now, I'm going to cover a lot of theology here in just a couple of minutes, just compacting it so you have to listen carefully. Verses 1 through 11 out of Joel chapter 2 deal with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a single day. The day of the Lord is a period of time that begins immediately following the rapture runs through the tribulation period, runs all the way through the millennium up to the great white throne judgment. That's what's called the day of the Lord or the Lordian day. The day of the Lord. All of that was originally prophesied for national Israel in Joel chapter 2. Now you know I've made a very clear distinction between national Israel and the church. We did an entire series on that about six or eight months ago. I hope you remember that. Because Joel chapter 2 is prophesied concerning national Israel, and the church is not in view in Joel chapter 2. And that's why it takes everybody by surprise on the day of Pentecost. Joel chapter 2. Now, why didn't they understand it in Acts 2? 
You see, the large insertion of the church, that is, people out of every nation, was not revealed in the Old Testament. Did you know the church was not revealed in the Old Testament? I hope you know. I'm not making this up. How do I know for sure that the church was not revealed in the Old Testament? Because Paul said so. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 for just a moment. Take your Bibles, please. Don't just listen to me. Follow along in your Bibles. Always check out what the preacher has to say. This is very important so we can understand the relationship of Joel 2 to the book of Revelation chapter 9 where the locusts appear again. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, so we know who's writing this, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I have told you all in the past. I told you how many mysteries there are in the New Testament. If you remember for sure, don't guess, if you remember for sure how many mysteries there are in the New Testament, just shout out the number. I know you're not used to doing that in Presbyterian Church. <laughs> how many mysteries are there in the New Testament? Not three. Seventeen. Seventeen. Now, how many of you were afraid to shout it out, but really did remember it was 17? Raise your hand. One person remembered. All right. Well, I'm glad. There are 17 things that are called a mystery in the New Testament. Maybe we'll do a study on them sometime. But we have one specific thing that is told us was a mystery in the Old Testament, right here in this passage. A mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed in the New Testament. I'm not making that up either. That's what Paul says. He gives us the definition of a mystery here in Ephesians 3. How that by revelation, I'm in verse 3, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which, now here's our definition, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, what's the mystery of Christ? He's going to tell us here in this context. He tells us first what a mystery is. In other words, it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, but it's now revealed. And here it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In other words, the church. The church is composed of everybody, Jew, Samaritan, Gentile, Old Testament saints, through your four categories that you move through as you expand the gospel through the book of Acts, if you've been with us on, on uh, Sunday evenings as we've gone through, the Jews in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, we have a guy who was Gentile by birth but became a Jew, but he's neither male nor female because he's a eunuch, and then we have the Samaritans, and we have men and women and children. They're half Jewish and half Gentile. And then we have the oppressor nations, the, the Romans, in fact, a, a centurion who gets saved next. And then we have a female head of the house who gets saved next in Acts 16. And then we have an entire household gets saved, the, the Gentile jailer at Philippi. And then we get down to chapter 19 and, and we have Old Testament saints, people who have knew that the Messiah was coming. They trusted in the promise that John had given them, but they hadn't realized that he had come and gone. The expansion of the gospel. We have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. Oh, we have millennial promises about what's going to happen, where all the nations are going to flow to Jerusalem, but we don't have the church revealed. 
And that's what Paul's talking about here. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am the least of all, uh, less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. He's still talking about the same subject. From which the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, either Paul's lying to us or he's telling us the truth. He said, from the beginning of the world, up till now, it was hid. Nobody knew it was going to happen. That will help us understand why things in Joel are closely joined together and we don't see any breaks in Joel. But there's a break. And the church gets inserted in the middle of it. And we'll see that in just a moment to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Even Satan couldn't guess this one. Principalities and powers, that's the same thing that he uses in chapter 6 where he talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. God said, I got a surprise. Satan's been focused in on Israel. He's trying to destroy Israel. I'm going to keep my promises to Israel, but I had one up my sleeve that Satan didn't know about and all of his demons didn't know about and nobody ever knew about from the creation of the world until now it's revealed. That's Ephesians 3. That's what he's talking about. Okay, that helps us now to understand the prophecy in Joel, which deals with locusts and why it includes things in the same context for national Israel that are separated by 2,000 years, at least 2,000 years. Joel chapter 2, beginning verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now here's the promise. And I will restore, I will restore to you the years not just the last crop. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. God has some incredible promises for Israel. That's what's going to happen during the millennium. He's going to restore to them the years, the years that the locusts hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. <laughs> God calls the locusts his army. Think if he wants to send his army, he can do it. If you think they're without number, you could never count them. You bet. We're going to see something about locusts and armies in the book of Revelation. The millennium is a restoration to Israel when they come to national repentance. That's the context. During the last three days of the tribulation, you remember we talked about that out of the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and 3. Come and let us return to the Lord. There's repentance. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain. Which Joel just talked about. The prophecy of restoration of national Israel is upon repentance. And it's the same in the book of Joel, verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. The praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And that context is the prophecy of the end times. Verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Sounds sort of like the promise about the locust. <laughs> None never been like this before. Wait till this one hits you, this army. A fire devoureth before them, behind them a flame burneth. The land is in the garden of Eden before them, behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, nothing shall escape them. Sort of sounds like the locusts that ate up everything in Egypt. 
Notice how a lot of this description can fit the book of Revelation locusts. I'm just going to read it through because our time is running out. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains shall they leap. That's what locusts do. Like the noise of a flame of fire devoureth the stubble, a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall much be pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty women, they shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his way, they shall not break their ranks. Think of a locust spreading across the earth. Neither shall one thrust through, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Oh, his army, here we are again. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can abide it? That brings us to the plague of locusts in the book of Revelation, where we find all the plagues of Egypt magnified. And as with the other plagues, a more deadly kind of locusts are found in the book of Revelation. A new kind of locusts. Locusts appear in the second set of judgments in the book of Revelation. Now, you remember there are three sets of judgments. For those of you who don't have an outline of Revelation, let me give it to you. The first three and a half years are what are called the seal judgments, like a seal on a document. And there are seven seals, and each seal gets broken, a new judgment comes out. That takes the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. Great Tribulation is seven years long. Then you have the second set of judgments, which are called the trumpet judgments. That second set lasts also for three and a half years up to the final week. So the seal judgments, three and a half years. Trumpet judgments, three and a half years minus one week. Then you have, finally, the bowl judgments that are poured out during the last week of the tribulation. And those are the judgments that lead to the national repentance of Israel that we saw in Hosea chapter 6, when Israel finally admits they don't have any source of help but God. And they recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. Oh, why does God send these judgments? It's to bring us to repentance. I think our judgments here in the United States that have come upon us are to bring us to repentance. All the heritage, the Christian heritage that we've had in this magnificent land is being eaten by the locusts. Everything is being eaten out. There are a few vestiges, a few remnants here and there, but the locusts are eating it. You'll notice also as you go through those three sets of judgments that they intensify. That is, they get worse and worse and worse as you go through the three specific stages. Locusts first appear in the second set of judgments and they are near the end of the second three and a half years. In other words, this is close to the end of the tribulation because this is one of the more severe judgments. Revelation chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, that's he blew his trumpet. So you've already had all seven seals have been opened. You've already had four of the trumpets blown, and now the fifth trumpet is being blown. And I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You remember when we were back at the beginning studying how locusts can completely block out the sunlight, make everything dark, can completely cover the ground. We saw that that's what happened with the plague of locusts in Egypt. And there have been other historical plagues where 
where, as they were passing over, people down below were totally in the dark because there were so many locusts up above them. Here's the picture we have here. Notice something else. These are not regular locusts. Because a regular locust cannot sting you like a scorpion does. In fact, since they're coming out of the bottomless pit, it tells you something else. These are supernatural, demonic locusts. And they have a different target. In fact, Revelation makes a point out of telling you these locusts don't eat green stuff. It says they don't have anything by which they can hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. They have a different target. God says, I'm going to make it personally painful. When the locusts eat up all the green stuff, everybody suffers. But I'm going to selectively choose a group who's going to suffer. Just like he did with the land of Goshen. And you remember, different ones of the plagues mentioned the fact that when that plague hit, it affected all of Egypt except the land of Goshen where God's people were. God selectively chose out. In fact, Pharaoh sent on occasion down to Goshen to see if there was any problem down in Goshen. There was no problem. None. God says, I'm going to do the same thing here. When the locusts come in to eat, that is, when they come in to sting, I'm going to separate out those men who have my seal in their forehead. They can only hurt those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. You know, we don't have time for the study here, but um, there are certain demons, and the scripture makes this clear as you study all the different passages, there are certain demons that are already bound in the bottomless pit that are so vicious that they will not be released until the tribulation period. And the several different places in the book of Revelation, it talks about different ones of these demons which are released and unchained at that time. Then we get to verse 5, Revelation 9, 5. And to them, that is to these locusts, it was given that they should not kill them. So they're going to sting, but they will not kill. But that they should be tormented. They have time to repent. They're going to suffer. They're going to suffer like nobody ever suffered before. They should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, I grew up in Texas. We have scorpions in Texas. And they're nasty little critters. They have those great big, huge ones. They're little teeny weeny brown ones. But you know, a little teeny weeny brown scorpion about that big can really, really, really hurt. And it swells, and the pain will not go away. It doesn't matter what you do. It's there, and it's there, and it's there, and it's there. And it lasts for days. Now imagine it, five months, day and night, no relief. The pain is there all the time, all the time. And they're going to hit everybody on the face of the earth who doesn't have the seal of God in their foreheads. They're going to hit everybody who has the seal of the Antichrist. But just in case somebody managed to get away who didn't take the seal, the mark of the beast, the distinguishing characteristic is the only people they don't hit are the ones who have the seal of God in their foreheads. Oh, dear people, how oh, thankful I am I'm not going to be here during this period of time. I mean, that wouldn't affect us as believers, but the rest of the tribulation period is certainly a misery. In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. You know, I can't prove this, but I suspect that means people won't even be able to commit suicide. It says death will flee from them. God says, you know, the reason I'm sending judgment is to bring you to repentance. But just like Pharaoh, they hardened their hearts. Now, remember the prophecy in Joel chapter 2. We just read this thing here. It says, the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces the faces of men. Remember what we saw back there as we were looking at Joel. 
this, we're in Revelation still, they had hair like the hair of women. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Boy, these are scary looking things. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. They had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. These are angelic beings, demons, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. That means destroyer. This is not like a purposeless horde of locusts. These locusts have a king, a powerful, mighty angel named Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. We talked about those divisions of the judgments, the 21 judgments, each increasing in intensity. Notice how locusts fit into the series and how each of the other 10 plagues of Egypt fit as well. And I want you to see the next plague. I'm just going to read it to you out of Revelation to see how similar it is in the supernatural locusts. The sixth angel sounded, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which held the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. There are angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. These other angels were bound in the bottomless pit. We have some angels being bound in the Euphrates, according to this. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Over 8 million people in the world today. Suppose it was 9 million. Billion, excuse me. <laughs> million, yeah. Billion. Think of what it will be like. This judgment kills one third of the earth's population. Three billion people. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them, and I saw the horses in the vision, and they that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth of brimstone. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. These are not natural. This is supernatural. But look how closely they resemble those in the fifth plague, the fifth trumpet. These are, the, by these a third... These three was a third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. Now, they don't have tails like scorpions. Look what their tails are like. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads. And with them do they hurt. And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues. Now, look at this. It says it twice here. We're going to see it three more times in Revelation chapter 16 when you get to the bold judgments. But look about this. Why does God send these locusts and these plagues? To bring men to repentance. And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils. You know that's what the pagans are doing. They don't know it, but they're worshiping devils, demons. And idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which none of you see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. During the tribulation, everybody's going to be involved in that kind of stuff. People are going to run around and kill people. They're going to be involved in all kinds of drug abuse and witchcraft and sorcery. They're going to be involved in all kinds of immorality, stealing everything they can get their hands on. It's not going to be a pretty time. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorcerers, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Again, the key is repentance. Judgment will always continue when men like Pharaoh refuse to repent in their arrogant pride. That's true for us too, folks. They know that it's God who's sending the judgment, but they refuse to humble themselves before him. And of course, that's even more pronounced by the time we get to Revelation chapter 16, the bold judgments. Dear friends, is there sin in your life? Is there sin in your life? Only you know your heart. 
you and God. There may be a few people who've been watching you who know about it too. You want the locust to eat all of your labor? Is your focus on the things of earth? Or is your focus on things of heaven? We're neither rust nor moth up dirt. And where thieves don't break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the lesson of the locusts. You spent a lot of time on the locusts because there's so much to teach us, especially about the law of harvest, especially about the need for repentance from sin, instead of hardening our hearts. And the warnings of judgments to come. And our friends and neighbors who don't know Christ will have to go through that if they're not here. Make us zealous for the good work so that our neighbors might see in us what we speak about with our lips. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it powerfully in each of our lives. That Jesus Christ, your Son, will receive the glory. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 600.